Mm-hmm. Gabba Gabba, hey everybody, uh, welcome to Associate 204, the lecture on society. Um, this is meant to be kind of a addendum or encore to the three culture lectures that we've had. Uh, because the term society and culture are often used interchangeable. People will say, well, in this society, well, in this culture. Um, but in fact, they're two different things. So we're going to talk tonight, today, whenever you're watching this, uh, about some of the concepts associated with society that are a little bit different from talking about culture. Culture has these elements, norms, values, sanctions. Society has elements too. But let's start with a very... Um, textbooky definition and you'll find something interesting and distinct uh, about society in that that culture is a subset of the concept of society so here's your textbook definition of society that so will flash up on the screen now oh there it is a society is a group of people that share a culture political authority and a space so culture is part of society. A society is a group of people that share a culture, a political authority, and a space. And so when we when we define it that way, a society can be very big. The United States has uh, a culture, the culture of the American culture that we've been talking about. It has a authority structure with this crazy guy with weird hair at the top. <laughs> How long can this last? But, you know, we have a sort of political structure, a federal structure, state, local governments. We have kind of a national structure that guides our society um, and all the other sort of structures in, the, in the, the churches and the schools. And then we have a physical space, the 50 United States of America plus Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands and Samoa. I remembered all four. Uh, and so that is a society, but a society can also be very small. So in the typical experience of a college class, which is different from what we're doing right now, you have norms and values. A class starts at a certain time. Uh, be, students behave a certain normative way. The professor behaves. There are values like let's learn. There is a political authority. Right, students and the teacher, and of course the teacher uh, responds to the chair of the department, the chair of the department responds to the dean, and the dean responds to the president of the university. Um, you should know the president of PCC if you don't know. He's a pretty impressive guy. And uh, there's a physical space, the classroom, you know, building seven, room 110. Uh, we're doing it a little bit different this way, and this highlights kind of a new way we think about society, because when we talk about society, we should say, uh, norms and values, political structure, and space. But now when we say space, we might also include this space, the electronic sphere that m m many of us interact with, cyberspace. I mean, there are societies that are just existing online. They're not in a physical space. They're in the space of the internet. So we're kind of updating that notion of that element of society. But so society has those three elements, culture, political authority, and some type of physical or metaphorical space that it would exist in. And so often the term that we use here when we talk about society, which is what we're going to kind of get into today, is this notion of social structure, that there is a pattern of social relationships um, that guide uh, what a society looks like. Social structure, pattern of socially defined relationships. That's the definition. So I'm, I'm going to go over through the four elements of society and then we're going to be done for this lecture. I'm going to try to make it short and I've already spent four minutes talking about it. So the first element of society are what we call status. Statuses. Statuses are positions in a hierarchy. Uh, and um, we think often of a, a status as a ladder. Right. And there are sort of two ways of thinking of statuses. One, the co most common way of thinking of status is what we would call achieve status. The idea that you have a certain amount of power to move up the ladder and maybe move down it too. But so the uh, achieve status would be like becoming a, a college graduate. You're going to PCC, you get your, you achieve your high school diploma, right? You did that, you did that. And then you achieve your AA degree, right? At PCC. And then a lot of you will go on to a four-year school and get your BA or BS, 
And then some people go on and masters and like, and you're just sort of moving up the ladder. You're achieving status. You can achieve the sta status as parent, right? Some people will try to do that. Some people, will, oops, I did it again. But you know, that is a status that you have power over and that you achieve. Um, you can achieve fame, right? We'll talk a lot about this in America. This is the thing that people really sort of want these days is fame. So, you know, you're, you're the next American idol. So you go through all the levels. Oh, there's American idol again, and you move up through all the platforms. And then finally you're in the top 20, uh, or you can achieve fame in sports or fame in, you know, the theater, uh, and you can achieve wealth too, right? You start from rags and you go to riches more on that in a second. So this idea of achieve status is you have a certain amount of control on the ladder. But the other type of status is what we would call ascribed status, ascribed status. And what ascribed stat a status is a place in the ladder, in the status ladder, that you're born into that you have very little control over. So we would talk about our big demographics. Gender is an ascribed status. Despite you've come a long way, baby, we still live in a patriarchal society where there is incredible amounts of violence against women and discrimination against women and women are girls and women can't be presidents in the United States and on and on and on. I think all women understand this. All men are like, well, I don't get it. But uh, believe me, there, gender is an ascribed status or at least... Um, the way we think of gender is an ascribed status that you're sort of locked in. And it, it's possible to move up, but it's hard to overturn patriarchal power. Uh, race is an ascribed status. Despite the fact that we had a black president way back when, there's still embedded white supremacy in our society on all levels. It's not guys burning crosses. It is the way we do business in America and just the image of whiteness as the normal, correct way to be and everything else is extra creates a kind of caste system uh, uh, based on race. And I think all people of color understand this. And white people are like, what? I don't know. We had a black president. What are you complaining about? Uh, and so there is an ascribed status there. There's an ascribed status based on gender, uh, uh, sexual orientation, despite will and grace <laughs> and other things like that. Ellen, uh, there's still a real uh, social blockage to people who are gay. There are still states in this country where gay people are not allowed to adopt children, where people are screaming at them that they're going to go to hell, and on and on and on. And I think all queer people understand this, and all straight people are like, well, I don't know. It seems like you got will and grace. Uh, and so these are ascribed status. You are sort of born into these positions on a ladder, and you have very little control over the, mo the mobility issue, which we'll come back to, the mobility issue. So this brings us back to the notion of wealth as a status, that generally in America, we think of it as an achieved status, right? I'm going to become rich. I'm going to move up the ladder. I'm going to go from the, from the you know, working in the mailroom to being the president of the company. I'll own this company one day. Like, that's the sort of thinking. But when we really look at the data, uh, people are sort and it's a little depressing for the most part, except for our favorite stories of the basketball player who was on the basketball court in the ghetto and is now playing for the MDA, MDA, <laughs> NBA, NBA, that's what it's called. Oh man, I miss sports. NBA, uh, making, you know, seven figures. Most people stay at the same level. And as we'll get into in our discussion of social stratification, there's actually very little mobility. Most of us kind of stay roughly where we started out. So the question here is, is wealth an achieved status or an ascribed status? We love those achieved stories of people that went, you know, from down here and won the lottery and now are up here. Most people, you're kind of stuck where you are, including the rich people. It's hard to give away, you know, billions of dollars. You know, they sort of stay rich and the poor people stay poor and the rest of us sort of are stuck where we are. So there's a big debate within sociology whether or not wealth is an ascribed status or an achieved status. And I'll let you decide. One more thing about status. Um, when we talk about our old friend Karl Marx, he's got a real clear status ladder. It's pretty simple. The bourgeoisie, the owners on the top and the proletariat, the workers on the bottom. It's a very simple ladder to sort of understand. He had some, you know, discussion about the middle class that he called the petite bourgeoisie, the little bourgeoisie. Um, but it's a pretty static model, right, of the, the workers and the owners, the haves and the have-nots. Max Weber, who we talked about, remember Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, remember that one, uh, was always arguing with the ghost of Marx. And one of the things 
he kind of felt Marx missed was this notion of, of status, that he felt Marx was overly simplistic, that everything was too economically determined. And what Weber argued is that there's more than one ladder that we exist on. Uh, and he called this, instead of class conflict, he called it class, status, and, and power. And so what he meant is, there, there, yeah, there's an economic ladder where the rich are at the top and the workers are at the bottom that Marx talked about. There's also a political uh, power model where some people have a lot of political influence and that's where their power is from and there's lots of people that don't have political influence. There's a lot of people who feel, why should I even vote? Why does my vote matter? And there's some people that have so much political power, right? They're so plugged into the halls of government. And, but that's a separate ladder. And then there's a third ladder that he called prestige where people have a lot of political sway. I mean, think of a rock star, right, who has a lot of influence. And if a rock star wears a certain type of jeans, everybody goes out and buys those jeans. Or a rock star says, save the rainforest. And everybody's like, the rainforest must be saved. And there's that type of chris, what he called charismatic authority. And that you, you actually, instead of the one ladder that Marx talked about, you have these three ladders, class, political power, and prestige. The class is sort of the classic Marxist one, but there are these other two added. And it would be possible to be high on one ladder, like the economic class, and be low on prestige, right? There's some rich people that nobody cares about or what they have to say. There's some people that have political power that don't have wealth. And he called this sort of odd ranking uh, status inconsistency. Status inconsistency. So the example I always use is... Um, when you, uh, they give these surveys to, to Americans almost every year, and one of the questions is, what is the most prestigious profession in the, um, turn it away from the Starbucks side, <laughs> not Starbucks, the Ramones, um, that uh, what is the most prestigious occupation in America? And so what do you think that might be? Well, in America, routinely what comes on in at the top are Supreme Court judges. And if you think about it, that's a pretty big job, right? These people, Ruth, these people are determining the core meaning of our Constitution and how that impacts our life, right? They make decisions that impact all of us. And it's a really, really small group of people that have some really heavy work to do. And so they're at the top of the ladder. Right behind the Supreme Court judges, <laughs> Typically, what ranks number two with a bullet? College professors. College professors, very prestigious position, let me tell you. When I was single, um, what do you do? Uh, and uh, and so so they're, they're, they rank fairly high on that ladder. But oh, but if you look at college professors on the class ladder, on the economic ladder. You know, they're just worker bees. They're just working at low levels. I mean, I always thought as a kid, college professors lived in these big houses. Um, I mean, it's relatively big, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, they're relatively low-wage employees. And so they can be high on one status ladder, prestige, and low on another, the class ladder uh, that Marx talked about. So that's what... Um, Weber meant by status inconsistency. There, you could be different ranks on different ladders. And, but if the ghost of Marx were to come back and argue with the ghost of Weber, like a grudge match in heaven or hell or wherever they are, um, Marx would say, yeah, you can come up with these examples, M Max, of you know college professors. But in reality, when you look at the real world, the people that, excuse me, the people that have the economic power, uh, are the same people that have the political power, are the same people that have the prestige. They're pretty much the same across the top. Uh, and so it, I was right that, you know, Carl would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm right. Really, it all comes down to who has the money. I mean, look at who's in Congress. <laughs> Excuse me, it's getting a little bit late. A little bit late in the house. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So that's some ways of thinking about status uh, and status inconsistency. Uh, and then we also have this term called master status, which is which ladder do you most associate with? And I would think, for the most part, the, the ladder that you're most concerned with is probably the ladder that you're on as a student, right? First year, second year, transfer. Uh, that's master status. The second concept uh, with society are roles. The roles, and these are sort of the flip side of statuses, the roles that we play, these patterns of expectations uh, of behavior that we take on. And just think of roles, the easy way to think of roles are roles like in a, in a 
play or in a movie or on a TV show. You play a role. We play a lot of roles, and we'll talk a lot about this, including talk about gender as a performance role, the way we perform maleness or femaleness. And we play, excuse me, a lot of roles. Uh, we play the role uh, of student, and you, you know, we show up at your Zoom class, and you do all your readings, and you turn in your assignments. I don't get the people that don't, didn't turn in assignments. I just, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and... Uh, you play the role of family member, right? You play the role a role to your parents. Uh, you play the role to, you know, if you have any siblings or children, you play a different role with them. You may even wear different clothes in different settings for, for coming to class versus, you know, going to visit your parents. You play the role of employee, right? How you dress and act and perform at work. Sometimes you might even speak differently or hold your body differently. And so we play multiple roles. Uh, in our society, and so all societies are made up of roles, whether, whether it's the medicine man, and the midwife, uh, and the warrior, and the goddess, worshipping priestess, you know, I mean, there are different roles, whether it's a tribal society or a complex society, we're all playing our roles, the role of the garbage collector, very important role in our society, the role of the teacher, the role of the child care provider, I mean, these are all roles, and as societies get more complex, sort of two things happen. One is there's a lot more roles, like there's a lot more roles to play. The role of food deliverer at the moment, thank you to the person who just brought the Chipotle to our house from Chipotle, that is a very important role in society at the moment. The healthcare worker, an important role. Uh, and there's lots of roles within healthcare, right, including the people that just sort of clean the bedpans. So there are, um, you get more roles, but you also get people performing more roles. So that means, have you ever heard the phrase, you know, I, I wear, I'm wearing this hat right now? Like a lot of times when I'm being interviewed in the media, I'm trying to figure out which hat am I wearing? Am I the criminologist? Am I the sociologist? Am I the social activist? Am I the cultural commentator? Am I the dad? Um, there was a uh, last summer, I guess, last summer, we had a tornado in our neighborhood in Northeast Portland. It was like the weirdest thing. We had a uh, EF0... Uh, neighborhood, uh, a, a tornado in the neighborhood, just blew right right past us. We were in the car driving up in front of the house, and the tornado just came by, pulled this big tree out, knocked out the power lines right in front of us. And then the, the news crews showed up, and they're usually interviewing me about murders and terrorism and things like that. And so they came to talk to me because I had just seen this tornado as like the witness on the street. And I immediately went in, I forgot what hat I was wearing. And I started talking about the kind of cultural impact of things like this. Uh, and I was playing the sociologist role instead of the, the witness to a tornado role. And it was really funny when I appeared in the news. Instead of saying Randy Blazak, extremism expert, it just said, Randy Blazak saw the tornado. <laughs> it's like, so I, you know, but so this is the important thing about this issue is that more roles that we play, the harder it is to figure out which hat to be wearing. And this is a thing called role strain, role strain. And the reason I, I take a moment to mention this is I think a lot of PCC students get it that if you are a student and you are working, so there's two hats right there, and you have kids and your active duty military, maybe, like there's four big hats. Uh, and there may be other things, you know, if you have more than one job. I mean, often we wear a lot of hats and it's, try to, it's hard to figure out what role that we're supposed to be focusing on. So one of the issues that a lot of PCC students have is what happens when you have a sick kid and you have a midterm to study for? Which role do you play? Do you be the good student and study for your midterm while your kid's like... <sighs> Or do you take off the student hat and be, play the parent role and take care of the kid, but maybe you end up, you know, scoring less on the midterm because you couldn't study because you were playing your parent role. So that's the idea of role strain. And I think that's something that PCC students, a lot of PCC, I mean, I was really lucky. I went to college with a lot of rich kids whose only role was to be a college student, right? They didn't have jobs. They didn't, they didn't have anything. Their parents would put money into their bank account, and their only job was to go to class, study, and get good grades. There was no other role. They didn't have kids of their own. They didn't see their family until it was the holidays. Their only role was to be a college student. That is what we call a luxury. Um, so roles. Uh, the third part, and I'm just going to briefly mention the third part. The third element of society is what we, what we consider groups. How people 
col collect, collections of people, how people group themselves together. And there's sort of two ways of thinking about groups here is we have sort of groups that are, are what we call our primary groups. Our primary groups are groups where we find our kind of identity from, the main group we interact with. That could be our ethnic group, uh, for especially for a lot of immigrant populations, as it's very true, your main source is, you know, I am a Filipino. I'm just hung up on Filipinos at the moment. Um, that, uh, or I am, you know, uh, Russian. You know, this is sort of my my social group. Our family can be our primary group. If you spend a lot of time in, especially if you have a big family, uh, your your if you have a real uh, intensive job like being a cop. Police can be your you know, primary group, so it could be your occupation. But there are also secondary groups, groups that aren't our main source of identity, that we sort of, that are temporary, that we can kind of flow in and flow out of. So if you're a, a Blazers fan, again, sports, uh, if you're a Blazers fan, you know, and you like go watch some games with some friends, you're in the group of Blazers fans for a little bit, but then you go out of it. It's not your primary source of identity. So again, as we get more and more complex as a society, there are more and more groups that we can be a member of. So that's really simple. The fourth one is the most complex. And it's a term that's so important in sociology, and it's the concept of institutions. Institutions are a fourth element of society. And institutions are um, what we consider to be basically all of the above. Uh, the definition of of institutions roughly is a stable cluster of norms and values so culture and statuses roles and groups <laughs> so it's essentially all of the above but the idea of institutions is that they're there to perform a basic need so we would think of religion as a as a broad institution or a particular thing like the catholic church or uh the muslim mosque in our neighborhood as a specific institution but religion is there to perform a certain need uh, the bank is an institution, right? It's how we take care of all our financial lives. It performs a function in society. So if we go back to our functionalist model of society, it's the elements of the cell or a different institution. And obviously, the family is an institution, right? The family has norms and values in it. The family has a status ranking with the parents and the kids and maybe the grandparents. The family has roles, including, you know, the middle kid and the and the breadwinner of the family and who does the cleaning. And the family is a group, right? It is a primary group. Uh, and what I wanted to say about uh, institutions is the idea from a functionalist perspective, from a kind of Herbert Spencer, Emile Durkheim perspective, is all the institutions kind of change together. But often, since these institutions are so big and complex, they're very hard to change. You know that if you ever heard the phrase, you can't fight City Hall, uh, it's really hard to change these very complex institutions. So sometimes we, we get our, what we get are sort of institutional lags where they, they're changing, but they're not changing together. So an obvious one of, uh, of institutional lag is the institution of technology, which tends to change kind of fast, right? Because technology is always revolutionizing itself. And the institution of religion, like very slow. And so how does, you know, the Pope deal with contraceptive or contraception or cloning or stem cell research, right? All these technological advances are coming to help people live better lives. And the church is like, yeah, I don't know what well, it's life. What do we do with stem cells, right? There is a lag between those two or the institution of the economy, very complex, but kind of can be flexible as we've seen over the last two months, how quickly can the economy change, right? It's been mind blowing in all my years. I never thought I would see the American economy going whoop, like that. It is just frightening. Uh, so, so think about the institution of the economy and the institution of the family, right? Often there are times when you can't spend time with your family. We're supposed to value the family because you have to spend time at your job making money to pay, pay your bills. Uh, and so there's a lag there. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, there's so many with religion. Like, I always think military and the religion, there's a real cultural lag there. Because there, thou shalt not kill, but go, you know, bomb some boats in the the um, Persian Gulf. And yeah, it'll be okay. Uh, and so there are all kinds of lags. So that, it just reflects the complexity of this concept of institution. So these are all elements that we are going to be referring to as we go forward. Talking about society being culture plus statuses, roles, 
groups, and institutions. Uh, and that is going to lead us to the next conversation we're going to have, which is a really big one, which is also going to let us talk a lot about gender, and that's socialization. And that's coming next, but I promise this one will be short and sweet. Oops, sorry. I don't want to give a plug for Starbucks. Yes, I do. Their drive through is open, and those people are risking their lives. Thank you for your service, Starbucks workers. Um, okay, that's it for now. And we'll see you when we see you. <laughs> All right. Peace.